Demystifying the Occult, a presentation for youth. Okay, some topics that we're going to cover are things like the New Age, meditation, etc. Also psychics, seances, and things like ghosts. As well as the vampire culture, magic and the occult, aliens and UFOs, and we're going to end with a presentation on 2012 and the Mayan calendar. So the first stop is, what does the Bible say about things like magic and the occult? In Leviticus 19.31 it says, Give no regard to mediums and familiar spirits. Do not seek after them, to be defiled by them. I am the Lord your God. So God basically says here, don't have anything to do with psychics or mediums. And also notice that he says that they would defile us in some way. So we're going to look a little more in detail into that aspect in just a minute. But first let's look at some other verses. Deuteronomy 18 verses 10 through 14 says, Let no one be found among you who sacrifices his son or daughter in the fire, who practices divination or sorcery, interprets omens, engages in witchcraft or casts spells, or who is a medium or a spiritist who consults with the dead. Anyone who does these things is detestable to the Lord, and because of these detestable practices, the Lord your God will drive out those nations before you. You must be blameless before the Lord your God. The nations you will dispossess listen to those who practice sorcery or divination. But as for you, the Lord your God has not permitted you to do so. And as you can see here, there's a ton of other verses that also show the exact same thing. That the occult in its various forms are bad and that God doesn't want us doing them. So one of the questions I had is, why is it bad? Surely God has a good reason why he doesn't want people to do this stuff. I mean, I think that we should obey God either way. But from what I know about God in my own life, whenever he forbids us to do something in his word, it is because that doing it would harm us in some way. See, he created everything. He knows how everything works. He knows how stuff like mediums and psychics and all that occult stuff works. So it also stands to reason that he knows that something about all that stuff would harm us if we did it. So in order for us to understand why all this stuff is bad and to understand how it all works, we need to do a quick study about the forces that are behind it all. There's a branch of theology called demonology, and it's basically the study of demons. The Bible says a whole lot about demons, so we can understand things about their characteristics and things about their motivations. For instance, we find that they have intelligence. In fact, we find that they're very smart. And a lot of times we find that they use that intelligence to be deceiving, deceptive. I have here also that they empower psychic ability. And what I mean by that is that we see in the Bible people that can tell fortunes or psychics. It says that they can do so because they have a demon. In fact, in Acts 16.16, 16, Paul casts a demon out of a woman and she's no longer able to do this. And we're going to look at that a little later. Satan and his angels can talk and shout. Moving on, um, it says that they seek and accept worship. That is, that they desire to be worshipped and that they can also receive that worship, usually in the form of them indwelling idols. Uh, they can perform lying signs and wonders. They are very powerful. They can do supernatural things. And they are subject to Christians. What I mean here is that the Lord has given Christians his full power and authority over all demons so that they should not harm us, as it says in Luke 10, verse 19, and many other places. And we're going to look at that in greater detail as we continue. So the question is, how do they start to be able to manifest or mess with people and even possess people? What do people do to open up the doors in their lives to these demons? Now keep in mind, there are various levels or degrees that demons can mess with people. It almost never starts out in full-blown possession. And the stages have been described as oppression sometimes. This is kind of, they're able to sort of mess with you, make you feel bad and things like that. Attachment is kind of a more severe version of that. And then finally possession, like we see with the guy among the tombs in Mark chapter 5. And we're not told exactly how one begins to open these doors in their lives, but we do find a lot of clues, like Judas is a good example. Now, it says that he was possessed by Satan himself the night that he betrayed Jesus. Now, we know that Judas had opened up his heart to evil, possibly with greed issues. We find that in John 12, 6, because he was stealing from the money bag and things like that. So, sin in general can be a way to open up doors slightly. Uh, severe anger can open up a door. We find in Ephesians chapter 4, 26 and 27. 
From missionaries' experiences, demon possession also seems to be related to the practicing of magic and the worshiping of false gods in different cultures and things. Scripture repeatedly relates idol worship to the actual worship of demons. We see this in Leviticus 17.7, Deuteronomy 32.17, Psalm 106.37, and an interesting one, I think, is 1 Corinthians 10, verse 20, where Paul says, But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. And I would not that ye should have fellowship with devils. But what by far opens the biggest doors of all, and what we're going to be talking about today, can pretty much be summed up in that list that we read earlier in Deuteronomy, which says, quote, who practices divination or sorcery, interprets omens, engages in witchcraft or casts spells, or who is a medium or spiritist. Now these are the things that we find open up the big doors in people's lives. And the more that they do them, the wider the door is opened. This concept will really help you understand all the issues that we're going to be talking about today. God set up this world and he gave us free will, the ability to make our own choices. Now he warned us, he told us not to do certain things because he knew that those things would harm us, but he wanted to allow us to make our own decisions. It's all about human free will in one sense. God's given us the opportunity to choose to love him, and he's also given us lots of opportunities to choose different things in the context of that. Ephesians 4.27 says, Neither give place to the devil. This means that we can, in some way, give place to the devil. And what that word for place is, is a Greek word called topos. And what it means is an opportunity, power, or an occasion for acting. There are certain things that we can do to give these demons an occasion for acting in our life. And the Bible says, don't do that. Now, the demons have a rule, too. And it seems that they require humans' free will in order to control or to mess with them or to manifest or to possess a person. That means that they need to trick a person into inviting them in. Because most people aren't going to knowingly ask for a demon to come into their life. And in just a minute, we're going to talk about the many different ways that demons trick people into doing just that, inviting them into their lives. But first, I want you to notice that they have a motive. Because unlike angels, who seem to have bodies, when we see demons in the scripture, they're always seeking to get in somebody else's body. They don't have bodies themselves. They seem to be almost desperate to be in a body. Actually, anybody, animal or human, will do. In Mark 5... They practically begged Jesus to send them into some pigs when he cast them out, because apparently pigs must have been much better than nobodies at all. So what is the alternative for them? Jesus describes their realm as dry places in Matthew 12:43. He says, "When the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places, seeking rest and findeth none." So they want in very badly. But they can't get in unless people ask them in. So they trick us into asking for them. And they know that most people won't call out and summon demons directly, like actually some Satanists really do that. So they find other ways for most people. And there are lots of other ways out there. So let's take a look at a few. And there are things like this, the Ouija board. And it's supposed to allow you to communicate with the spirit world, right? Well, it does in a sense. Um, but here's the secret about the Ouija board. It's just cardboard and paint. It has no special power of its own. It's just a way to get humans to ask for contact with spirits in their hearts, even though they might not necessarily say that with their mouths. What I mean is that when you sit down and you're playing with the Ouija board with your friends, or you go get your tarot card reading at a psychic or whatever, what you're saying in your heart is, spirits, I want to know what you have to say. I want to contact you. I want you to be here. I want to hear what you have to say. You're giving them, in your heart, the only thing that they need. Their only rule is that they need your free will. They need you to invite them. And that's what things like the Ouija board and tarot cards are doing. They're tricking you into giving away your free will. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean that you can be fully possessed by a demon at this point. As I said, something like full possession almost never happens all at once. It usually happens in stages. And this may allow them to start harassing you or causing supernatural things to happen in your life. Usually what they try to do then is they try to use that little door in your life 
to trick you into giving them an even bigger door. A really good example of them using a little door to trick you into opening up a big door is with the New Age practice of meditation. When someone first gets involved with meditation, they'll tell you what you need to do is to clear your mind totally of anything. You've got to really practice on getting everything out of your mind. You must not have any will of your own. You need to be open to anything. Note that the person may not, like in the case of the Ouija board, be expecting the spirit to show up. But notice that the emphasis is still very much on the human free will. In this case, all the meditation techniques say to work at totally getting rid of your free will. To be completely passive, open to whatever happens. And this is sometimes called the passivity of will. Now, getting rid of your own free will is like letting down your guard. It's like telling a security guard to go take a break. <laughs> because your will is out of the way, it allows demons to affect you, even if they usually can only affect you very slightly at this point. But I want you to see what they do with this little tiny open door that people innocently give them, and how they use it to create a big door later on. What normally happens in the case of meditation is that the demons will use this state of the person, having their free will guard completely down, to do something supernatural feeling to them. As I mentioned, they don't have much access to the person at this point, but the passiveness of the will has given them just enough of a right to do something supernatural. So people usually report a supernatural feeling of some kind, maybe an intense unexplained emotion, it can be a vision, Several people have reported hearing voices. And this makes the person say, Wow, this meditation thing is the truth. I have literally felt it work. Now this makes the person start to try to find out more about meditation, to go even deeper into meditation, and to get more of the power that they think is available if they go further into meditation. That initial supernatural feeling is kind of like the bait at the end of the fish hook. And there's no shortage of books and websites out there that tell you what you must do to go even further and to get the most out of your meditation and how to get the real power. And what they start to tell you is that in order to get the most out of your meditation, you need to start to call on spirits. Now, all these folks have different versions of what the spirits are. None of them would say that they're demons. Instead, they call them things like spirit guides or angels or archangels or ascended masters or even dead relatives. But here's some quotes from some websites. And notice that they're telling the person to ask for the contact. Remember, from the Ouija board example, that's all they really need. They need you to ask for them in some way. This meditation website says, Set your spiritual intent to contact your spirit guide. If you like, do a prayer to ask for spiritual support as you make contact with your spirit guide. Inwardly call in your spirit guide. Start to open up your awareness of their presence. You may see them, feel their presence, hear them communicating, or somehow just know that they are there. As spirits, say hello to your spirit guide. Allow yourself to receive a hello back from your spirit guide. So many of these things are appealing to the will of the person in, in this quote. Inwardly call in your spirit guide. Set your spiritual intent to contact your spirit guide. These are a picture perfect example of what demons need. And here's another quote from a meditation website. It says, and as we continue to breathe in and out very deeply, we Call upon your guardian angels and the archangels to make their presence known? So you can see that at least in some cases, meditation leads to the very same place, getting people to invite spirits into their lives. So let's move on and let's talk about psychics and ghosts and seances and all that stuff. I think the first place that we should look is in the Bible, where in the book of Acts, we find some very revealing information about all of this. So Acts 16, verses 16 through 19 says, As we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners much gain by fortune-telling. She followed Paul and us, crying out, quote, These men are servants of the Most High God who proclaim to you the way of salvation. And this she kept doing for many days. Paul, having become greatly annoyed, turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out that very same hour. 
But when her owners saw that the hope of their gain was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the rulers. So here we find a few interesting things. First, it was a demon that was giving this woman the power to tell fortunes. And when Paul cast out the demon, she was no longer able to do this. And the guys that were making money off her ability got mad at Paul. What you need to know is it's not even really that complicated how demons can tell us things about our lives that no one else knows. It's not because they can read your mind or they can tell the future. In fact, I think that Daniel 2 verses 27 and 28 and other places show us that they cannot do this. It's all basically because they watch us. I'm not sure if we have certain demons that are assigned to us, like C.S. Lewis envisioned in his book, The Screwtape Letters, or if they alternate or whatever. The scripture doesn't really say. But they do observe us, and they know things about you that nobody else knows. They know what you ate for breakfast. They listen to you tell your friend that secret that nobody else knows but you and them. They know things that you're really interested in. So if you go and you talk to a psychic, and that psychic has her own life massively opened up to demons through the occult practices that she does, and they can communicate with her, they communicate to her the things about you that seem very impossible for the psychic to know. And she, like the lady in Acts, makes much gain from this. Another aspect of this is that demons communicate with one another. They network with one another, if you will. So, for instance, if you asked a psychic that something only your great, 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 great grandmother could have known, like where is the will hidden or something like that, the demon that was observing your great, 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 great grandmother hide that will knows where it is. And so this explains things like seances, where people go and they try to make contact with what they think are their dead relatives. What they're actually contacting is something I believe are called familiar spirits in the Bible. I've seen so many people stuck in the occult because of this trick. They've been told something about their loved one that is past that only they could have known, and so it proves to them whatever else was told to them. Now, the Bible says that it is appointed for man once to die and then to face judgment. It also says that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And we're going to understand a lot more about this as we look at the next topic. Ghosts. Now, there are a number of TV shows out there nowadays that go around looking for ghosts. And while I think there is some fakery going on with some of those shows, I also think that there are some genuine supernatural things that are going on in other of those cases. Oftentimes, if a place is haunted, like a room or an entire house, it's not because someone died there or any of the other reasons that people on those shows say, but it's because rituals have been done there. Sometimes they can be satanic ritual sites, or more commonly, things like seances or other types of summoning of spirits. The demons are territorial. They go only where they've been given the authority to go, like we see in Mark 5 with the pigs. That's why sometimes only certain rooms are haunted. Only certain rooms have had rituals and things done in them. More often than that, however, that is, in most cases, it is not the house that is haunted at all, but the person, if you will. I've heard people say to me that they moved from house to house and from city to city, and all the houses that they moved in were haunted. Scary things would happen, they would see and hear things all the time. Now, in that case, it was because they had opened up themselves to the demonic realm by their practicing magic and other occult things. They themselves were the problem, not the house. It's really important to realize that in these haunting cases, the demons are playing a kind of game. They want you to believe a different version of the world than the one that is in the Bible. They want people to believe that the afterlife is not based on the Bible or based on Jesus at all, and that it's about reincarnation, or they offer lots and lots of different alternatives and stories. Like at seances, the so-called ghosts always come up with a different version of what the afterlife is really like, and that's why there's a million different books on what the afterlife is like, because the demons are always telling just a random story. Whatever the person is into, they'll say, well, it's about whatever you're into, you know, magically. So the people think, okay, well, maybe the afterlife isn't like the Bible, and they start their drifting away from the Lord, and they start getting into the things of the occult, because, well, this is where the truth is. Maybe I should start studying about this and getting more into this and those kinds of things. 
At this point, let's take a quick break from all the talk about demons, and let's talk about one infinitely greater than all the workings of the enemy. That is Jesus. It says in 1 John 3, 8, For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Luke 10, verses 19 and 20 says, Behold, I give you power to tread on serpents and scorpions, and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Notwithstanding, in this rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Christians have authority to deal with demons. All Christians have this right. It's not a gift of the Spirit or anything. It's just part of being a Christian. Jesus thought it was necessary to give us this ability over all the spirits. And it wasn't just to the apostles or even just to the 70 others that followed Jesus. It was for brand new believers of all types. The disciples even had a hard time understanding this, but Jesus kind of straightens them out in Mark 9. Starting in verse 38, it says, And John answered him, saying, Master, we saw one casting out devils in thy name, and he followeth not us. And we forbade him, because he followeth not us. But Jesus said, Forbid him not. There is no man which shall do a miracle in my name that can lightly speak evil of me. For he that is not against us is on our part. And these demons are totally scared of Jesus. One example is in Matthew 8:28 and 29. And it says, And when he had come to the other side into the country of the Gergesenes, there met him two possessed with devils, coming out of the tombs, exceeding fierce, so that no man might pass by that way. And behold, they cried out, saying, what have we to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of God? Art thou come hither to torment us before the time? These exceeding fierce demons were exceedingly afraid of Jesus. They knew that he had the power to torment them. It's interesting to see how the most scary things in the universe, from our perspective, are terrified of the one that we know as the Lamb. I was thinking about making a t-shirt that says, Beware the Lamb. Another example of the demons being afraid of God is in James 2.19, where it says, Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. <laughs> okay, now that we've taken a, a Jesus pit stop here, let's continue in our study of the enemy and his ways. After all, 2 Corinthians 2.11 says, Lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. Aliens. So what does the Bible say about life on other planets? It doesn't say anything, for or against, really. I suppose that it's possible that God could have created an infinite number of planets like Earth, but the Bible simply doesn't say. But I can be sure that the phenomena that we've been seeing for the last 60 years or so, the UFOs that people report and the alien abduction testimonies that we hear, are definitely not from beings from other planets. Let me read some quotes from people who've been studying this alien phenomena that we've been experiencing. Now, these are people that are not necessarily Christians, but they are really big names in UFO research, and they do a lot of study about it. They say things like, One theory, which can no longer be taken very seriously, is that UFOs are interstellar spaceships. Arthur C. Clarke said this in the New York Times Book Review. Also, George Crichton, in a 1992 Flying Saucer Review policy statement, says, There seems to be no evidence yet that any of these craft or beings originate from outer space. This is an interesting one from Lynn Cato in a report that she did for the U.S. Air Force. It says, A large part of the available UFO literature is closely linked with mysticism and the metaphysical. It deals with subjects like mental telepathy, automatic writing, and invisible entities, as well as phenomena like poltergeists, manifestations, possession. Many of the UFO reports, now being published in the popular press, recount alleged incidents that are strikingly similar to demonic possession and psychic phenomenon. Here's an interesting one. Dr. Pierre Guerin says, UFO behavior is more akin to magic than to physics as we know it. The modern UFO knots and the demons of past days are probably identical. John Keel said, the UFO manifestations seem to be, by and large, merely minor variations of the age-old demonological phenomenon. Trevor James says, a working knowledge of occult science is indispensable to UFO investigation. Another one that I think is really interesting is with Whitley Strieber. He's possibly the most famous alien abduction case, and he wrote the book Communion, which was wildly successful. 
He says, I felt an absolutely indescribable sense of menace. It was hell on earth to be there in the presence of the entities. And yet I couldn't move, couldn't cry out, couldn't get away. I lay as still as death, suffering inner agonies. Whatever was there seemed so monstrously ugly, so filthy and dark and sinister. Of course they were demons. They had to be. And they were here, and I couldn't get away. And I think that the best evidence of all is the fact that certain people that have experienced so-called alien abduction have reported that when they called out to Jesus, the attacks totally stopped. It didn't matter if they thought they were on some spaceship being tortured or whatever, they were immediately back in their bed. Oftentimes people experiencing this are people that have been heavily involved in the occult or magic, and there are a few other reasons, but the large majority of them have opened up doors in their life in this way. I personally know the people involved with the ministry to help people experiencing these attacks, and they now have hundreds of testimonies of people on their CE4 research group website of people that have ended these encounters with these demonic beings by calling out to Jesus and ending them for good by giving their lives to him. Their mission statement on their website says, The mission of CE4 Research Group is to share with the world the most powerful evidence known that exposes the alien entities for who they really are. That evidence is in the testimonies of those who have overcome the experience, the oppression, the bondage, the harassment, the control, the lies, the deception that these entities perpetrate by calling out in the name and authority of Jesus Christ. Through this evidence of the testimonies, we will be able to help others. The world asks for this evidence, and we will give it to them. We share this evidence through any means of communication available. Let's move on to a really popular one. The vampire thing is a strange one to me. I'm sure that most of you know people, or even you yourselves have read the Twilight books, and were not able to put them down and all that stuff. And I think that there's a reason why these books and movies are so seductive. The author of the book, Stephanie Meyer, said that she received the main characters in a supernatural way. She said that they were, quote, quite literally, voices in my head. This is similar to the author of the Harry Potter books, J.K. Rowling, which says, quote, The character of Harry Potter just popped into my head, fully formed. Looking back, she says, it was all quite spooky. And she also says that the books almost wrote themselves. So am I claiming that these books were written by demons or something like that, you're asking? And in a way, I am. As we're going to see, just like in the 2012 stuff and in the original New Age material, it all came by the original author's own admission, word for word, directly from spirits. Again, demons are really smart. And when people open doors for them that are wide enough to where they can start to speak to them or write through them, the demons often produce very seductive writings. But what would the purpose of it be? Mainly the purpose is the same purpose for all the other stuff we've been talking about. To get people interested in the occult. To get them wanting to acquire powers like those that they've seen in the movies or in the books. And the guys, they're seeing that all the girls are really into vampires, so they're all over the internet trying to figure out how to be a vampire. And here's an interesting clip from one of the websites explaining how to become a vampire. It says, But for those who are faced with the question of how to become a vampire without being bitten, there is an answer for this dilemma of theirs as well. There are spells and magical means that are used as ways to become a vampire. These spells or magic are said to cast some of the unusual physical and psychological characteristics typical of a vampire. Which features of a vampire are to be bestowed upon the initiated depends upon the type of spell or magic used. Possession is another method of becoming a vampire. In this, the body of the would-be vampire is possessed by some spirit. Without question, if someone even has the slightest curiosity about becoming a vampire for any reason, they're going to be met with the most blatant invitations to practice the occult or magic. Or things like this website which says you need to seek possession by a spirit in order to become a vampire. I mean, talk about obvious. Now you can see who benefits from all this. They have a problem. They want in. But they need you to invite them in. And this is just one way to do that. In fact, this one has people practically begging to be possessed by a spirit. All right, now let's look at 2012 and the Mayan calendar and all this stuff. So, the Mayan calendar. The Mayans had different calendars for different things. And the one that all the fuss is about is the one called the Long Count Calendar. 
Now, this is the one that they use to reference the passage of time over 52 years. See, they had a special name for every single day. Now, they didn't do it like we do, which is to repeat months and just change the year. For instance, we had a July 4th in 2008, and we had a July 4th in 2009, and we had a July 4th in 2010, and we're going to have a July 4th every year. That's because we repeat the same 12 months over and over and just change the year every 12 months. But they didn't do this. They gave every single day a special name. There were no years, which basically meant that they had to have a whole lot of names. And the regular calendar could only fit the special names for 52 years. But this caused a problem. If they wanted to talk about a day that was farther away from 52 years, they needed a totally new calendar. So, for instance, if they wanted to talk about history, like they said, Hey, Grandpa, when did our Mayan forefathers settle in this land? Well, Grandpa would have to walk over to the long count calendar and show them when their forefathers settled in the land, since it would have been longer than 52 years ago. Or, let's say they wanted to talk about the future, like, Hey, Grandpa, how many hundreds of years will it take for this constellation of the stars to move from this part of the sky to the other part of the sky? Again, they would have to walk over to the long count calendar to figure it out because mapping stars, positions, and things like that require referencing times much longer than 52 years. Often hundreds or even thousands of years were needed. So you can see that they would have to set this calendar so far in advance that it would be useful for those types of things, talking about the stars and constellations and things. But because of the way that they had it set up, it had to reset at some point, or else it would have had to been an infinitely big piece of stone that just went on forever. And all the fuss is that they did, in fact, reset the calendar on a certain date, and a date that must have seemed for them an impossibly far distance of time, December 21st, 2012. And that is where the truth ends. The fact that the Mayan calendar ends on December 21st, 2012 is literally the only thing that is true about all this. What happened then is that some people started making all kinds of claims, trying to figure out what it all means. Why did the Mayans end it then? Did they know something that we don't? And all these people are guessing because the Mayans sure didn't give us any clues. There is nothing in their writings that suggests they thought that resetting their long count calendar was significant at all. The people that try to say that they were telling us that doomsday was coming or a new rebirth was coming are simply putting words into the Mayans' mouths. Because all they did was restart their calendar as you would expect them to do. It's kind of like a future civilization from us looking back on us and, and assuming that we all believe that December 31st and January 1st, when our calendar resets, means something very, very special to us which it has no significance to us whatsoever. I mean, we might celebrate New Year's Day, but that's about it. It's just a necessary function of having a calendar that must reset. Now, in the last few years, people have been saying all kinds of stuff is supposed to happen. They say on that date there's going to be a galactic alignment or a pole shift or planetary alignments and all this stuff. So I'm going to play about an eight or nine minute clip from a video that I did called 2012 Debunked to talk about the so-called scientific evidence of all this. Let's start with a very common claim that on December 21st, 2012, there will be some kind of alignment with the center of our galaxy. There are two main versions to this part of the theory. One camp says that the alignment will be when the sun rises above the horizon on December 21st, 2012, the winter solstice, that the sun will rise in the middle of the Milky Way galaxy, thus causing an alignment with the Earth, Sun, and the galactic center. And it does, in fact, seem to do this, more or less. You can verify this with an astronomy program. There are, however, at least two problems with this. This event is only significant from the Earth's point of view. The precession cycle, or the roughly 26,000 year wobble of the Earth, only causes the effect of the stars changing position on the horizon and therefore only the effect of a galactic alignment. If you were viewing this from anywhere else in the solar system, it would be totally insignificant. This is only a visual effect, and only from the Earth's perspective. And no gravitational force or radiation can be expected from this event, because other than the tilt of the Earth, nothing will be any different than the last few thousand solstices. We will be no closer to galactic center on that day than on any other day. 
the other camp of the 2012 alignment issue is probably the more significant one because it's dealing with the solar system's actual location in relation to galactic center. The idea is that our little solar system is moving around the center of the galaxy every 225 to 250 million years or so. And while doing this, it's also moving up and down in a cycle crossing the middle of the plane every 33 million years. So, the question is, are we going to cross that galactic plane in 2012? Not even close. According to the journal Nature and others, there is evidence of crossing this plane 3 million years ago. This would mean that we are moving away from the galactic plane and won't be due to cross for another 30 million years. Not to mention that the margin of error in these calculations is at least 2.1 parsecs, or about 6.5 light years, making images like these completely meaningless. Moving on to the idea of a pole shift. Although many theorists disagree on whether this pole shift will be magnetic or a physical shifting of the crust of the Earth, the reason for this happening in or around 2012 is usually cited as one of the following reasons. Planetary alignment, Planet X or Nibiru and its comet's tail, a tremendous sun flare, or an asteroid. The first one is easy enough. There is no planetary alignment on December 21st, 2012. This is what the planets will look like on that date. There is a link on the screen to an online program that you can check this out for yourself, too. Let's take a look at some of the Planet X theories. The idea of Nibiru, or Planet X, is traced back to Zachariah Sitchin and his translations of the Sumerian texts, and specifically to his interpretation of VA243 cylinder seal, which he says shows that the Sumerians knew of 12 planets, minus the sun and the moon, which they considered planets, and this would mean that there is another planet. His interpretation of the seal is wrong. The Sumerians have an unambiguous symbol for the sun, a circle with four triangles around it, like rays, and squiggly lines between the triangles. That is emphatically not the symbol in the seal. The symbol used in the seal is that of a bright star, this symbol for stars is very commonly used, and this is the symbol that we have in the seal. So even Sitchin's basic premise is wrong. For details on this, and on what the seal actually means, see Dr. Michael Heiser's paper, The Myth of the Twelfth Planet, a brief analysis of Cylinder Seal VA243, available at his website SitchinIsWrong.com. Another argument against Planet X is the absence of any evidence for it. For Planet X to be here in less than a decade, it can't be farther than a billion or so kilometers away. Even at that distance, it would be one of the brightest objects in the sky. Remember, tiny Pluto is 5 billion kilometers out and can easily be detected using modern equipment. And Pluto is way smaller than Planet X is supposed to be. Some claim it's because it's hiding behind the sun, and that's why we don't detect it. If it was behind the sun, it would be moving at its fastest point considering its projected orbit, and it would only be behind the sun for a very short time. There are a lot of claims about Planet X out there, like the observatories being closed down to keep the information from the public, which is not true at all, besides the fact that they would need to confiscate every telescope in the world to keep this secret hidden. There's also been postings of pictures and other so-called evidence of Planet X, all of which have been shown to either be an admitted hoax or a mistake of some kind. There are actual pole shifts that do occur, both magnetic pole shifts and physical pole shifts. And we are in the middle of a long process of a magnetic pole shift, the biggest effect of which is that we will have to relabel our compasses in a few hundred years. The following is an excerpt from an article from NASA. Reversals take a few thousand years to complete, and during the time, contrary to popular belief, the magnetic field does not vanish. It just gets more complicated, says Glatzmayer. Magnetic lines of force near Earth's surface become twisted and tangled, and magnetic poles pop up in unaccustomed places. A south magnetic pole might emerge over Africa, for instance, or a north pole over Tahiti. Weird, but it's still a planetary magnetic field, and it still protects us from space radiation and solar storms. I might suggest that it's ridiculous to pinpoint a specific date, such as December 21st, 2012, for this happening, not just because it's such a slow process, but because the proposed reason, such as a galactic alignment, isn't even true. 
thus making it a non-issue. The other kind of pole shift is a physical pole shift. Let's first set the record straight that this would require an event of tremendous energy and that it is not part of any cycle or natural occurrence and no increasing of solar energy would be enough to cause this. We have actually had a few degree shift of the poles in the past, but not a reversal by any means. It's what's called a true polar wanderer. William Sager, in an article entitled, Texas A&M Oceanographer Challenges Plate Tectonics as a Reason for the Pole Shift, says, our data set indicates that this polar shift took place at a rate between five and 10 degrees per million years. He said, essentially, it happens within the blink of an eye in terms of geological time. So what this means is that scientists who call this event fast call fast five to ten million years and that predicting a specific date for this to happen is again ridiculous especially considering that we are told that the Mayans predicted it using the understanding of precession which couldn't have any less significance to this event no matter how well that they understood it. All right. So it's interesting because if you've been following all this stuff for more than 11 years, as I've been, then you know that everything that's supposed to happen on December 21st, 2012, was also supposed to happen on May 5th, 2000. But when that date came and went, they just moved it forward, and they tried to connect it to the Mayan calendar at that point. I guess to make it seem all scientific or whatever. And the last 11 years have been just full of deception about this issue. And here are some of the people that have brought us the new 2012 theories. Now the reason that I'm showing you these guys is because I want you to know that they have something in common besides being the originators of the 2012 ideas. They also got most of the information that they've been telling us all about 2012 from the spirit world through various occult type methods. So in really plain terms, they were told all they know about 2012 by demons. Now, none of these people would say that it was a demon that they talked to. They believed that the spirit they talked to was a good spirit. For instance, Jose Arguelles, this first guy, he's sometimes referred to as the father of the 2012 theories. And he believes that the messages that he got was from a long-dead Mayan priest. He actually changed his name because the spirit is so completely overtaken him, apparently. He now calls himself Volum Votan and has legally changed his name. This next guy is named David Wilcock. And he got his information about the year 2000, as well as the year 2012, from a spirit that called himself Ra. Now, this spirit was claiming to be the ancient sun god of the Egyptians. This next guy, Terence McKenna, got his 2012 information from a spirit that called itself the Lagos. And this fourth guy is named Daniel Pinchback. And he got his 2012 information from a spirit that called himself Quetzalcoatl. Now... These are the guys that you're going to see on the History Channel or the Discovery Channel telling you all about galactic alignment and pole shifts and the Mayan calendar and everything. The question I always ask is, is how come your spirits, if they're so smart or whatever, are so wrong about all this supposed scientific information? Does the Egyptian sun god Ra not know very much about astronomy or, or what? The answer is obvious. That is, that the beings that they've been talking to are deceiving them. Which brings us to one of our final points. 2 Corinthians 11 says, And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. And this pretty much explains all of the new age that we're about to look at, as well as many different things like the 2012 stuff. Satan and his demons can pretend to be good. They can literally change their appearance and pretend to be whatever the person is interested in. For example, Daniel Pinchbeck really liked Quetzalcoatl, and so when it showed up to him, it was Quetzalcoatl. Now, they can't just show up to anybody on the street and pretend to be Quetzalcoatl. The person has to be doing this occult type of stuff before they could manifest. In fact, all of the men that I just mentioned about 2012 were very into this occult type of stuff. They had wide open doors in their lives. The entire New Age movement is taken from the writings of two main people, Helena Blavatsky and Alice Bailey. These were two women who believed that they were contacted by good spiritual beings that called themselves Ascended Masters. They both wrote huge amounts of material. They even started a publishing company because they wrote so much. They called it Lucifer Publishing Company. 
later renamed Lucius Trust, which is what it's still called today. They both say that it was not them, but these spiritual beings that were writing the words through them. This process is called channeling, or sometimes it's called automatic writing. Their writings are very powerful, very clever, and seductive. I would never recommend ever reading any of them. On the occasions where I've had to read some of it for research stuff, I've made sure to pray diligently beforehand. It is very evil stuff. These writings are the basis for everything that we call the New Age today. 1 Timothy 4.1 says, In the latter times, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. I think this shows that these spirits are seductive and that they in fact write doctrines of some kind or convey doctrines at the very least. Now oftentimes when someone lets a demon into their life, the demons want people to go out and spread the message that they told them. They want them to start a blog or like they did with these two ladies, had them start a publishing company or they want them to go out on a world stage and go on the lecture circuit and all this stuff. But the messages that they want people to spread usually can be summed up in about five different main messages. They, they kind of mix and match, but it usually has something to do with one of these five messages. Number one is that you are God or you can be like God if you do certain things. Now, this is an old trick of Satan. And I'm sure people remember that way back in the Garden of Eden, Satan said, when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God. So one of the first lies ever recorded <laughs> was Satan telling humans that they could be like God. And this is one of the most used lies in the New Age too. So there's nothing really new about the New Age. Uh, the next one is that there is a coming age of enlightenment or an evolution of humanity. Really, 2012 is more to spread this message than anything else. Most people will believe like that 2012 is coming an age of enlightenment or an evolution of humanity. And if anybody spent any amount of time looking it up on the internet, you found that this is what is supposed to happen in 2012. And this is actually what the term New Age means. And without going into a whole bunch of detail of why, I think that the reason that Satan likes this idea so much about the coming New Age is that if people believe that there's a coming time of peace, then it will help them believe that the peace that the Antichrist will offer is the new age of peace that they've been waiting for. It really helps set up the kingdom of the Antichrist in one way. Uh, the next one is that aliens are somehow our genetic ancestors and then we can become like them. Now, I'm not sure if this is going to be used or not, but I wouldn't be surprised if it is because of the amount that it is used. Almost every movie for the past 20 years has had some kind of theme like this. Um, the reason it's so important, in my opinion, is that if you believe that aliens are real and they are in some way our creators, then you have to throw away God which is a big part of what would needed to, ha to happen in the Antichrist kingdom. Jesus predicts a massive falling away of faith. And this also would help with that second point that we mentioned, that if the aliens are simply more evolved than us, then we would naturally think that we one day could be evolved like them, that we could gain all the powers and the technology like them if we evolve to their level and that there's a big evolution coming into this new age. So it's sometimes tied in with that idea. The next one is that there are certain people that are holding us back from the evolution. And this is a really scary one if you think about it. Uh, when you read these things that they, they're saying in these writings, it's, it's, it's really awful because they're talking about how there's a certain group of people out there, which usually means Christians, that believe in these old fairy tales of the old age and that they simply won't go along with this new evolution. And they say that those people must be destroyed before the evolution can really begin. And they're talking about Christians. And we read in the book of Revelation that those who refuse to go along with the Antichrist's new kingdom are going to be killed. And the people that would do such a thing as kill people, I think are going to be told that they're doing the world a favor. They're going to be thinking that they're helping the world achieve this new age where there's going to be no more wars and all this stuff. But in order to get to that point, they have to get rid of the people that don't want the new system. And the Bible, of course, has warned us about all this stuff. It's even told us to watch out for a world system that's going to pretend to be peaceful but won't actually be. 
Christians won't be a part of that system because the Bible told them not to be a part of that system. And it revealed the truth that it wasn't what it claims to be. It tells us that that peace will only last a very, very short time, and then it will reveal its true nature. And the final thing is that magic and the occult practices are good. There are just many books and movies and television shows, even on the Disney Channel, that are saying that magic is good, it's a way to get power and all this stuff. And this one is obvious. We've been talking about it. Demons don't have a way to access us unless we start to do these things and give them legal rights. And so they trick us into doing these things and making us think that these things are good so that they can begin to mess with us and draw us in even further and open up bigger doors. So really all the things that we talked about today are trying to draw us into the things that will ultimately benefit Satan and his kingdom. Yes, there is some supernatural things that happen, but if you know that those supernatural things are the result of demonic activity, it's really not that mystical or fascinating, and it's obvious why we shouldn't do them. And one more thing, it's really no surprise that Christians are always made to look bad on TV and the movies and all that stuff, because Satan knows that he's been defeated. He knows that Christians have been given the power and authority over him and his demons by Jesus himself. It makes sense that Satan tries everything he can to get people to turn away from Jesus. He knows really well Ephesians 6.12, which says, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. Satan's just hoping that we, the ones who have been given this authority over these forces, don't know that we have it. So, in conclusion, Jesus is the answer. He is our hope. He is our protector. The darkness of Satan and his whole kingdom is absolutely terrified of the light of Jesus and his kingdom. And if you ever find yourself in a situation where you feel the presence of evil at all, remember that you can call out in Jesus' name for help, just like Paul did in the book of Acts when he said, Paul, being grieved, turn and said to the Spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And you can also pray against evil forces. You know, if you know somebody that's involved with all this stuff, you can not only pray for the Lord to help them and for their salvation, but you can also use the authority that the Lord has given every Christian to pray against the evil forces in their life. So don't get into any of these things that we've talked about today. They are all, without any exception, in some way or another, trying to get you to turn away from Jesus and turn towards the things that will benefit Satan and the Antichrist. Ephesians 5.11 says, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. Thanks for your time.